Okay, welcome everyone. We'll start in just a moment as we allow a few moments for people to get connected. I wanna say hello to all of our Amherst and ARPS community members, and we thank you for joining us on this community chat. We will be holding community chats like this on Tuesdays and Thursdays at noon for the next couple of weeks. Uh, my name's Brianna Sunrid. I'm the communications manager for the town of Amherst. In this webinar, to ask a question from the Zoom application, click the Q&A button to type in your question. Your questions will only be visible to hosts of this meeting. Additionally, if you'd like to speak, please use the Zoom raise hand button or press star nine from your telephone. We ask that you introduce yourself before asking your question and to maintain civil discourse. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded, so please refrain from asking any personally identifying health questions. So today, joining your town manager, Paul Bachman and I, we have Amherst School Superintendent, Mike Morris. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Before we launch into Q&A, are there any status updates from either of you? So I'll start, yeah. Um, so I was talking to someone on the phone earlier today and I had not talked with them since uh, March 10th or something. And the world has changed so much in, those, in the time since, uh, it, and it's, it's barely five weeks, I think. Um, and uh, it's, it's it has been a tremendous change in how we've done business, uh, the way we communicate with each other. Now we're using Zoom or Microsoft Teams or different platforms for talking to each other. Um, the services we provide has, has changed. Uh, we've just become a wholly different society. So that was really struck me this morning as uh, we're, I was talking on the phone with this person. Um, so I'm really happy that, that uh, with Brianna's help, we've really set these things up. So we're having uh, biweekly meetings every Tuesday and Thursday at noon, uh, and we record them. You can go to our um, COVID-19, AmherstCOVID19.org website and watch any of the previous ones. On Tuesday, we had a uh, police chief, Scott Livingstone, on, um, and we were supposed to have Julie uh, Fetterman, our health director, on today, but she is unable to join us. And it's okay because we've got Mike Morris also scheduled and uh, Mike has a lot to share with you, I'm sure. So I'm just gonna hand it off to Mike in case you have anything you wanna start with. Yeah, I'll just, I'll give a broad overview of where we are and then you know open up for much more interactive dialogue uh, as we go. So yeah, we're as, as uh, town manager said, we're on week five um, and it is a different world that we're in. And I think notably in the schools is that we've, um, the first couple of weeks, we were encouraged by the state to offer enrichment activities for students and families. And that shifted as this extension of the closure uh, statewide actually, as well as locally uh, took place. So we've transitioned to what we're calling distance learning 2.0, which is more structured to it. Um, there's much more interaction between uh, teachers and students. And really it was a group of over 150 teachers, paraeducators and administrators who put together the different plans, both at the elementary uh, middle school and high school level, as well as focusing on special ed uh, and English language learners who each have their own uh, distance learning plans. And so it's it's been a huge amount of work. I want to publicly thank our teachers. Uh, I promised someone that I'd wear a Fort River School shirt. So I am wearing a Fort River School shirt. Uh, those teachers, in addition to doing their normal duties, have organized uh, drive-bys through Fort River neighborhoods. Um, they did one about a week and a half ago, another one coming on Friday, which has been greatly appreciated. Um, I happen to live in the Fort River catchment area and was so nice seeing uh, folks in my neighborhood whose kids had graduated Fort River um, some years ago come out. Um, it was such a, just a community event, even though it was, I think, designed more for the, the staff and the students. And uh, the feedback I heard from staff is it was equally beneficial to staff as it was to students for them, for the staff to be able to see their their students uh, be able to wave at a physically safe place. I want to thank the Amherst Police Department for just from a safety point of view. There's not many uh, there's not much traffic on the roads these days, and, and there was a long caravan of cars, and they provided um, support for them, as well as uh, some interesting commentary, which I appreciated as they were going, making sure that kids were listening to their parents and uh, working well with us. So uh, that was that was fantastic doing it again, and, and I want to thank the staff all over the place, and particularly at Fort River. Um, so, you know, I'm open up, you know, we can open it up for dialogue or any comments and questions, but I think the big transition's been is providing more structure for families and and students in this process. And, uh, you know, it's a work in progress, obviously. This is not something our schools were designed to do a month ago. Uh, we didn't have distance learning plans, but I really think our staff have, have stepped up wonderfully to support students and families. Um, and it looks different at the elementary, middle school, and high school level, but I think we've made our approach age appropriate at each of those. Great, thank you for that intro, Mike. 
Um, I'm just going to remind our attendees who have joined us that if you would like to put a question, you can use the Q&A function in Zoom and type that, your question in. It'll only be visible to us, the hosts, and then we will read it. Alternatively, if you'd like to speak, you can raise your hand in the Zoom application and we will acknowledge you and um, unmute you so you can come into the conversation. So we have a couple of questions um, already on deck. So uh, one question we have for Mike is, um, what is being done for students who do not have internet at home? Sure. So uh, we spent uh, a lot of time looking at different options, um, furiously looking at other uh, different options that would work best for our families. And where we landed is that mobile hotspots were the best solution for to provide internet in homes that um, didn't, didn't have it already. So this week, actually Tuesday and Wednesday, we had a pickup and we did some delivery for families um, who weren't able to get there of, and I'm, I'm trying to forget the number, but I think it was between 60 and 70. Uh, we still have some families on the list that we have to work out drop off points for mobile hotspots. And the nice thing for mobile hotspots is they're already, we, our IS staff did all the configuring and they're plugging in play. You plug them in the wall and you've got Wi-Fi in your home. And we purchased, um, we purchase plans for them. Uh, one of the things that a lot of districts who are doing similarly is if they purchase something that wasn't unlimited data, doing things like we're doing right now pulls a lot of data. And so we did, we would provide the unlimited data plan. And this has been generously supported um, by the PGOs they, uh, in our district. They ran an amazing, across the whole district, they ran an amazing fundraising effort to support students. And with the unclear knowledge of when we're going to return or how we're return, really thinking about this digital divide, not just during this crisis, but actually long-term and how we could support them. So we're thrilled we got the hotspots out, kind of well-timed with the transition to distance learning 2.0. Uh, the folks who volunteered to, to either deliver or to drop off those um, in front of the middle school building said, just it was, it was just really nice moments that families, um, not just for the academics and the teaching and learning that were the primary focus, but so many, way, so many people, video conferencing like this is how families are staying in touch. Uh, and people are staying socially connected. And we want to support families in this time, not just on the academic side, but really on the social side as well, because we know how challenging it is. Great, we, we've got a comment here and a question. Um, thanks to all ARPS teachers and staff for the tremendous work undertaking in the last five weeks. Looking forward, is there any thought of offering catch-up opportunities during the summer? It's funny you mentioned, so we just had that conversation a little bit today. Um, we're not quite sure exactly what summer will look like. We'll, we'll you know, because we typically have some summer school programs, both credit recovery at the high school um, and some programs at the elementary level as well as special ed across K to 12. And so we're looking for guidance from the state and from local public health departments about uh, whether summer programs, it'll be possibly buildings, if it is possible to be in buildings, what the, pro what the programs will look like. I know for California, for instance, their governor has laid out a set of criteria that would um, limit the number of students in classrooms and, and really, uh, while students in the fall there will be returning to school, it won't quite look the same likely as, as it has in the past. So we're, we're trying to look at what that looks like and how we can support students. We know that in terms of summer opportunities, some of our students um, perhaps um, are having a harder time, not because of internet, I think we've done well with that, but just accessing uh, the rich curriculum that our, our staff offer. And so we're also looking from, um, you know, what some people call achievement gap, we like to call educational debt in our district and other places. Uh, how do we make sure that students aren't falling further behind during this time? And how, what do we do in the summer to support students so when they re-enter school in the fall, they're caught up? So all of those things, long-winded answer, I apologize, but it is something that we're actively working on, thinking about, and feel really deeply concerned about, both locally and nationally, about the impact on, on some students who distance learning uh, for their learning style, their child's learning style may not be the, the modality that is the easiest to access and, and how do we support them moving forward. So Mike, um, let me throw something in here. Um, we've all watched the interplay between the president and the governors about who makes the call, about what's open, what's not open. Can you talk a little bit about who makes the call about when our district is going to open again? And right now I think you are on May 4th, although that's been adjusted somewhat and you know, when will people know about when we're going to be open again? Yep. Thanks. Um, so that's exactly right. Um, so the governor right now, the, the existing order is May 4th, uh, that, and it was no sooner than May 4th. So I think that's one point of confusion. The governor did not say schools need to reopen May 4th. Just with the state of emergency, they 
were not able to open sooner. Uh, so I think probably sometime last week, about a week ago, I put out a statement uh, based on some information that came out of Bay State and other um, public health departments with concerns about Western Massachusetts and really recognizing that May 4th wasn't a reasonable date for return. And so uh, for me, I went date less. It was schools were reopened when I feel confident from both the public health perspective locally, as well as experts down at Bay State, that it's safe to reopen schools. Uh, I think it's uh, I think it's highly likely that the governor will um, extend the May 4th piece, given the the numbers we're seeing of, of confirmed positive cases of COVID uh, across the state. Uh, whether that's a spring cancellation, you know, and return in the fall or a later a push to a later date in the spring really is anyone's guess right now. But from my perspective, um, I'm not going to be comfortable opening school until the experts, which to me are the public health department and doctors and physicians, uh, assure me that it is. Um, and so I think like many superintendents in the state, we are looking for leadership at a state level on this. Um, and at the same time, you know, great working with the town of Amherst, Julie Fetterman has been absolutely wonderful. She's probably sick of getting phone calls from me at this point, but but uh, I'm lucky she still answers the phone. And and uh, I, I there can be statewide decisions and still I have to go to what the local uh, experts say uh, and, uh, you know, we, we don't take action steps in, in our district without talking to our local experts first. So ultimately, it's the superintendent's decision on when schools reopen, basically. It's, it's not that, the or president making the call. Um, that's, that's my belief. I know in New York City, that's getting a little complicated. Uh, <laughs> fortunately, Amherst isn't New York City. Um, and, and I don't think, well, the, those political complications certainly hasn't played out the same way in Massachusetts on many fronts as it has in New York, you know, for better or worse. Um, but I, I, I think to reiterate my point is, you know, working closely with local public health officials, um, both on whether it's safe to reopen, but also how it's safe to reopen. And I think that second piece is, is uh, perhaps not as much in the consciousness yet of the public, but I would say it's equally or more important because there's real questions whenever we come back, uh, what are the things that are going to be allowable? So if we do come back to spring, for instance, uh, I think it's it's highly unlikely we'd be able to have school-wide events with hundreds of people in that we usually have in the spring, not just at the high school level, but at all of our schools, right? That's not going to be every every expert I've seen has suggested that it'll be a gradual opening up uh, of schools, of businesses, you know, not just like poof, one day it goes back to normal. That normal is, is, a, is not the term that we'd be using right now. And so that's really, you know, I did have a conference call with the commissioner of education uh, with other superintendents this week. And a lot of the focus was just exactly that, trying to figure out what will it look like when we return uh, as well as when we return, but really what would it look like and what are the educational implications uh, of that? And so, you know, the six feet distancing, for instance, we, in our current model of school, there's not six feet between students and staff at all times. Um, if that's really, you know, if there's some distance that they're going to ask for, we're going to really have to ship our, shift our operations. And so I think um, the interplay between the date we return as well as how we return is, is what I'm watching for and certainly what I'll communicate out to the public as we get more guidance from the state and local levels. Thanks. Great. Thank you. So, um, Mike, next week was our normal April vacation week in, in the school system. Can you say a little bit about what that looks like now? Sure. So uh, we polled the staff in particular. We wanted to know what it was, what it would look like, what was preferable. Uh, and I work with the um, the association, the union president, um, teachers union president on this. And we both felt that based on what we were hearing from teachers, um, but the stress of the transition to the new type of work, as well as um, managing different family needs that they have, um, that we wanted to make sure that staff did have some break based on what we were hearing. So we gave multiple options and, and the option that came out with, I think 86% of our staff um, supporting it was to, um, was to have a two day week. So Monday's a holiday, it's Patriots Day, that would be off anyway. Uh, but to have school on Tuesday, have no school on Tuesday and Wednesday, make a five day weekend, but have school on Thursday and Friday from distance learning. Uh, there was a couple of reasons we did that. One, or staff are supportive of that. One is it made the end of the school year Thursday. Um, I think it's Jan June 19th or 18th, whatever that Thursday is. Uh, if we didn't do anything, the school would have come back for a Monday in late June, which is um, nobody's idea of a picnic, so to speak. Um, but also we thought it would be the right mix of giving everyone a break, families, students, uh, and staff, 
uh, while not making it too long a break and having an interruption that would start on a Friday and not return a week and a half later on a Monday. That felt too long to staff and it felt too long to, to us. So I think it was a happy medium. I've seen districts go one way or the other. There's about six or seven districts that are, we're calling ourselves the hybrid districts. We're having some break, but also some school that week. I think Holyoke's the other one that's locally doing that. Um, but it felt like the right amount of balance. There's a lot of stress for, for staff, for families, and we wanted to balance that with also maintaining the kind of the operations that we have now in distance learning 2.0. Great, thank you. Um, I know we've gotten this qu next, next question a couple of times in different um, formats, but so does the current situation push back any of the, um, the funding from the state for the new elementary school? Right, so the town manager and I were on a conference call was it the week before last, Paul? Yeah. I, think, I think that's right, with MSBA. Uh, what they're telling us is at, at our sort of nascent stage of the process that we should continue and, and we, she asked if we could and we, we felt like we could, could continue our, our path, which means that uh, May 1st, our enrollment period opens up. Um, that enrollment period involves uh, the town forming a building committee, um, some work on I, my end, which is really just cataloging our maintenance practices and our current programming and, and thinking a little ahead to the future. But it, there's not high stakes decisions in the first couple months um, other than the, the, the formation of the committee, but not in terms of the actual building structure or anything like that. Um, so we are feeling like um, the last week, I would say, that we're able to, at the school department, take on, we made this transition around Distance Learning 2.0. We're able to get back to some of the projects that were on pause a bit, and um, this is one of them. So we feel good about where we are. I think uh, talking to other districts, there are some concerns because the construction in industry in general, um, there are staff who are, um, some projects have slowed down to, down to a halt, construction projects, and that is um, something that came up at the MSBA meeting the other day, and because districts who are in the middle of projects are concerned about cost escalation if construction stops for six months, all of a sudden you've got, you got challenges with that. Um, fortunately for, I mean, unfortunately for us, we're still far away from a newer renovated school, but the fortunate part on the timeline is that won't affect us. It uh, doesn't look like it'll affect, affect us because actual construction is quite a ways away. And the MSBA is functioning in a virtual environment the same way the towns and schools are. It's, it's different, but we're still having meetings and they're still having meetings and they had one this week. And, and so uh, for us, I think we're, we're continuing, we're staying the course and the MSBA is staying the course with us. I don't know if town managers, anything else that you'd like to add to that? No, I agree. I think you really summarized it as well. Um, so we will continue moving forward uh, again in this virtual environment when we start to um, form the school building committee and ask for volunteers who want to serve on that. So I think that that will be a, um, a good thing to be moving forward on. I, and I think you're right, Mike. One of the things I felt was that the last day or two, it felt like we could, I got our legs under us finally because we're just dealing with thing, thing after thing after thing and feeling like, oh, we can get our projects moving again. It reflects a little bit about how we're managing the town's um, meetings um, where, you know, in March, it was just pretty much the governing boards and, and April, we've opened it up to some of the uh, adjudicatory boards like the zoning board and the planning board and uh, board of health. And then in, and May, we hope to open it up to a lot more, um, excuse the phone, uh, a lot more um, uh, committees that can operate. And even this week, you know, the school committee and the uh, town council got together to, to select a new member of the school committee. So the school committee is back up fully staffed as soon as uh, Ms. Lord gets uh, sworn in. So, and that can be done virtually too, so. And Paul, when, when you put up the, the call for volunteers for that, it'll be on our, on our website pretty, pretty prominently. Is that correct? Yeah. And, and on the, hopefully the school's website as well. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. Social media to, as well. Yeah. Great. Um, I did see a couple new people come in. So I just want to remind people if they would like to pose a question, you can use the Q&A button in Zoom or raise your hand in Zoom. So next question we have here is about graduation and what that's gonna look like for our seniors this year? Yeah, so uh, one of the concerns that, well, there's a lot of concerns just about what the senior year experience has been. And, you know, I wanna state publicly what, what everybody I think would assume that we feel poorly that this isn't the senior experience we want for our students. And um, they've been wonderful at um, 
you know, bearing with us uh, as we're uh, trying to do the best. So there was this week, there was a meeting between the senior class advisor, who is one, one of them, who is the one of the assistant principals at the high school and the senior class council. And they've um, co-developed a survey that's going out to all um, students, seniors, uh, and as well as their families to try to gather some thoughts about different ways. And, and what we really felt strongly about wasn't that we, one solution or another, we really wanted in particular the students and, and, and to um, a large degree as well, their families, to be weighing in and, and helping us make a decision. You know, our job is to set parameters of what's reasonable. You know, we're, we're highly unlikely we're gonna be in the Mullen Center on June 5th. Um, just from a, a physical distance standpoint, that doesn't seem realistic. Uh, at the same time, what else we do? We've seen a lot of different models. The universities and colleges have, you know, you could see really different things that have gone on. Uh, so we gave them, uh, the students came up with a number of different scenarios as well as an open-ended answer of what are we not thinking about? And, and that relates both to graduation, things like prom, uh, other events that are likely to be canceled in the, in the near future just because of the physical distancing. And we're just, I'm just appreciative that our students jumped right in. They've developed a survey that I think would make our, our data folks at UMass and other colleges very proud. Really, really uh, smart survey that wasn't leading in any way, but provided a number of different options. Um, we, are, we are purchasing or have purchased um, some live streaming software that would allow for um, a model that, that could work. And we've contacted the, the graduation speaker was already identified. That person lives in California and, you know, doesn't seem like there's a scenario where they would be here. Um, so we really, there was about six or seven options as I remember the survey, as well as uh, what are we not thinking about? And we, we really want the students to make this decision as much as the graduations, people like me, you know, I get to go and, and say my piece and the high school principal and families. It's really important to us that we're honoring the students' legacy by giving them, um, putting them in the driver's seat to help us make a decision and really for them to be able to make it. And, and our only role is, you know, making sure it's, it's, it's safe it's reasonable uh, in terms of access for, for all of our families and all of our students. So stay tuned for that. And I can't wait the survey. Just, I think it went out to families about an hour ago and I think it's going, it might've already went to students. And we're, I'm really curious of, uh, of what they come up with and what ideas they have, but they'll certainly lead us to a better place than if we just got in a room with a bunch of adults and, and, and made a decision. And that's how we're leading on it. That's great. Thank you. I'd be curious to see what, what they come up with. Yeah. Um, Shifting gears a little bit, can you talk a little um, about the prepared mail meals distribution and what that's like right now? Yeah, so uh, since uh, so the 13th of March is when we closed. That was a Friday. We made the decision to close. The following Tuesday, we started meal delivery. Uh, we started at 13 sites. We added a 14 site, which is at Pelham Elementary School. Um, and we uh, the second week of that, we partnered with UMass, who took on half of our sites. And so we, between the two of us, it's about um, 2,500 meals a week um, that are delivered. Uh, for our service, we're now in a Monday, Wednesday, Friday schedule. We provide four meals at each of those drop-offs. Um, UMass is still on a daily schedule. For us, it was just um, trying to um, be as physically safe, keep our folks as physically distanced as possible uh, over the last, we started that, I think, last week. Um, and so we picked um, high density locations where we knew a lot of our families would live. Um, and it's the, the support that we've received is great. We just received a grant that was gonna support us with $2,500 more or $2,500 to continue and, and support that. Um, but our food service staff, our, our volunteers, which are staff members in the district who, who support the sites uh, have a really good method of making sure the meals are laid out in a, social, a physically safe way, uh, keeping distancing in mind and families come up one by one to get their meals. Um, and um, the demand has continued to be high, which I think speaks of food scarcity in our community at this point in time. And we're just, we're really happy that we've been able to contribute to um, support that effort that I know many, many people in the Survival Center, many, many folks in Amherst are deeply concerned and are contributing to food, um, to trying to help with food scarcity. But it's a very real issue because we know for many of our families, um, the fact that their children get two free meals a day in our district really supports um, them in, in a number of ways. And so we've been happy to be able to do that. And again, um, kudos to the Family Center um, and the Food Service Department who have just been rock star outstanding on this front. And we're gonna continue it till the end of the year. We're continuing, I, that's one thing I wanna mention is we'll be continuing it. We'll do Monday, Wednesday, Friday next week, even though Monday's a holiday, uh, we'll have staff in working on a Monday to make sure that we're continuing our meal service um, over April break. I just want to add on that, that the um, Senior Center is also That's doing right. on wheels for the seniors, which is terrific. 
Um, and then just this morning, we had a call um, with uh, Lev Van Ezra, who's the director of the Survival Center, because in our estimation, food security is going to be one of the big issues that um, sustains through the next, you know, we, we sort of think of things of, I call it the two, four, six, two weeks, four weeks, six weeks. But for the Survival Center, as we've talked to them, we talk about the next three months, six months, 12 months, 18 months, because I think with the economy and, 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 and such uh, depths of uh, being in bad shape that food security is going to be a major issue and supporting the Survival Center plus all the other um, groups that are working with that and to see where the town can step in and where the town can provide support and reprogram some of our money to uh, ensure that food scarcity isn't an issue um, and they have seen, uh, you know, Lev was saying that there's a tr tremendous uptick in the demand for services, both in prepared, prepared meals, a 50% increase just on that alone, but also for bulk foods and that the um, grocery stores are who used to donate so much, um, they have few, uh, so much bulk food, uh, they have less food to donate. So they're, they might be in the market for purchasing more, so they need funds to do that. And it might be ways that in terms of um, physical locations, we've talked about different locations that uh, we may be able to help expand um, their services because one of the things she also identified is that with the reduced bus service from PBTA, people can't get to the survival center and get home in a reasonable time. So bringing food to where people are, which is what the school district is doing with the prepared meals is something. So there's a million logistics that come into play with this. And um, so it's really good to have, you know, subject matter experts like like Lev, who's, who's thinking 24 seven about this and talking about what we can bring to the table to support. Uh, it's, because it's not just one solution. There's lots of people who are in this area who are all thinking and I think it's really great that we have such a robust uh, network of, of supporters here in Western Mass. Yeah, I think the only thing I'll add, I uh, agree with everything Paul said and we've been um, kind of encouraging. We have had staff who say we want to support this effort. You know, we know the school's food service and, you know, uh, we've been encouraging them to get in touch with the Survival Center, whether that's, you know, literal in-person support or, you know, um, financial support because of the great work they do. Uh, and we're all supporting the same people, right? And so I think that's really important to know. But our, we did, you know, the only reason we were able to start so quickly is because we do have a summer food service program that um, started uh, two, three years ago. And so we'll be, we'll be doing that again this, this summer as well, which uh, will support summer, uh, so our families while the school year, uh, while, the, while the school year is not in session. And just one little note, uh, Bistro 63 is also offering um, prepared food for um, restaurant workers who've been laid off. So there's a lot of um, grassroots things that are happening that are really, uh, really terrific. So I cut out uh, because my internet connection is being told it's, I'm being told it's unstable. Could you repeat that one, Paul? I'm sorry. I guess that Bistro 63 uh, oh. service workers is also on their own, oh, yeah. just offering support and food, uh, prepared food for folks, which is just, I love how, seeing how these things are popping up everywhere. Yeah, and I think I'll, if I could add to that just briefly, I know you're looking to get in, Brianna, but I think, there's so many stories like that. Like I started with the Fort River teachers. No one told them to make a parade through the Fort River neighborhood. They chose to do it because they thought, and, and um, you know, if we had more time in this, this show, we could we could each tell um, many, many stories of, of residents, staff of the town, staff of the schools, who independent of being asked to do anything have done just amazing acts of, of support uh, and courage during a really hard time. So I just want to thank everybody for we lost them. Oh, uh oh. <laughs> Internet stable. Yeah. Well, uh, I've, uh, I've definitely seen that in our community. Yeah. All right. Well, great. Well, thank you both. Um, on that note, it is time for us to head to wrap up. Um, I will say that we are going to be doing this Tuesdays and Thursdays at noon. Next Tuesday, we're going to have our special guest is Amherst Senior Services Director, Mary Beth um, Ogilewicz. Did I say that right? Ogilewicz. Yeah, that one. And um, she is going to be um, talking about resources for seniors and programming that um, she has going on. So if you have any um, seniors in your life, please ask them to tune in. We will record these sessions and they'll be on our YouTube channel as well as channel 17 um, for Amherst Media. So any last comments before we, we wrap? Yeah, I just want to thank the town. Uh, I'll let Paul have the last word, but I just want to thank the town for our continued collaboration. Um, it, it's it's infrequent that I have a day where Paul and I aren't either talking or texting or, um, 
not just, and I like the three, six week, nine week, right? It's it, we're, we're thankfully for the most part out of the three week piece, you know, or the current piece and we're thinking ahead. Oh, I could finish this sentence for him, I think. <laughs> just really appreciate it. I want to say that, that partnership. Yeah, no, say, right back at you, Mike. So yeah. thanks, thanks. And thank you to all our attendees today. If um, you had questions that didn't get answered and you want to email us, you can email us at info at amherstma.gov. Um, if it's a question for the superintendent, we will get it over to him um, and to and hit into his team for answering. So thank you all for joining us and we'll see you on Tuesday at noon. Yeah. Thanks, Brianna. Thank, thank you. you all.